the people in the country called Kenya are in such serious trouble. There is looming doom which very few people seem to see and even more people are determined to behave like the African ostrich. Yeah. Believing that if they bury their heads in the sand, the fire, which can be seen at a distance, will never reach them, will never touch them, will never affect them. And one of the big reasons why most people don't understand is because very few people actually understand what the office of the presidency is all about. Because if you don't understand that, then it will be difficult for you to understand why Kenya is in the problem she is in right now and why it is also true to say that the UDA administration is accelerating the problem, yeah? speeding the country towards that cliff where Mother Kenya will fall off. Okay? Now, I usually choose my words carefully. Yeah, so those are not exaggerations. Now, today's show is going to be a really super treat. Yeah, just on time for the weekend. Because we are going to dive into some super fascinating stories. Linked to the point I want to put across. That I'm sure many of us have never ever heard in their lives. When former President Uhuru Muigai Kenyatta sensationally lost the 2002 presidential elections to Emilio Stanley Mwekibaki, one of the most interesting and instructive comments yeah, on Uhuru's loss came from his own uncle, a man called Joroge Mungai. Now, to younger Kenyans, that name doesn't mean anything. But older Kenyans will know that Njoroge Mungai was the most powerful yeah, minister, cabinet minister, and also member of the Jomo Kenyatta Kitchen Cabinet, right from independence. And you see what made him even more powerful is that he was related to President Jomo Kenyatta. He was a nephew to the first president and founding father of the nation. So what did Njoroge Mungai say? Now I've not been able to get his direct quote, so I have to paraphrase from memory. Yeah. He said that the young man was not yet mature enough for the presidency, but he was perfectly positioned yeah, to mature and learn enough to take on the heavy responsibilities of the presidency. By the time Mwai Kibaki finished his term. Now, a presidential term in Kenya is five years. But of course, Njoroge Mungai meant ten years of the Kibaki rule. Yeah, if you are an African. And you have followed African history, especially concerning the presidency. You will know that once somebody is in office, <laughs> it has to be a ten-year term. Upende Usipende. That's how it goes. Now, those gems of wisdom from a man who was there, right next to the presidency, right from independence, were very instructive. And in fact, they ended up being prophetic. Okay? Because Joroge Mungai lived to see his nephew, Uhuru Kenyatta, being sworn in as the fourth president of the Republic of Kenya in 2013. And strangely enough, it's like it's the only thing he was waiting for. Because the very next year in 2014, this Stanford University in the United States trained medical doctor passed on yeah, at the age of 88. And even more interesting, at his funeral, President Uhuru Kenyatta was one of the pallbearers. Now, unless you correct me, I don't know of any other case where a sitting president has been a pallbearer. 
uh, but Uhuru Kenyatta carried the coffin of his beloved uncle while president of the Republic of Kenya in 2014. But for our purposes today, yeah, we need to focus on what Njoroge Mugai was really saying yeah, about the presidency. Why was Uhuru Kenyatta not qualified enough in 2002? What did he really mean? You see, the office of the presidency is not a joke, as has been proven over and over again. Yeah, we have seen things that any keen observer would have seen. For instance, current President William Samoy Ruto has aged decades just a few months into the office. But really simplifying things, this is the best way of picturing the office of the president. Yeah, here goes. The office of the presidency of the Republic of Kenya is a station where you have several balls flying in the air. You know somebody who's juggling several balls in the air? Yeah. You have several balls in the air, dozens if you like, and as a president, you have to choose which particular balls to focus on and which ones to ignore and let fall to the ground. Let me elaborate. You are a politician, you are an administrator, you are an economist, and also you are king. To even have a fighting chance of keeping a stable government running in Kenya, you will need to take care, yeah, be very careful, attention to detail, to those four functions of the presidency. And to make things even harder for a president, if just one of those functions yeah, goes terribly wrong, everything comes down. It affects all the other three. It will not matter what you do with the other three. Yeah. Your presidency will still calm down. I'm going to elaborate on that. Don't worry. I'm not making wild statements. I'll give you even examples. Now, some of these functions are self-explanatory. Others may not be obvious, like being a king. You see, in Kenya, people look up to the presidency the way the subjects of a king would look up to the king. Yeah, so you have to give leadership. You have to come across as somebody who cares about all Kenyans and not just a section of Kenyans or only a tribe. In the old days, people used to judge kings, a bad king, an evil king, or a good king, based on their wisdom. And their wisdom really was being able to feel the pulse of the nation and being able to behave in such a manner that everybody felt that their king was with them. Their king knew exactly what they were going through. And therefore their king was in a very good position to lead them forward yeah, and to ensure their safety and their prosperity. After the 2002 presidential elections won by Mwai Kibaki, yeah, and after the fallout within the National Rainbow Coalition, yeah, where members of the LDP, led by Raila Odinga, fell out with the Mwai Kibaki administration, LDP members were even removed from the cabinet. After that, Kibaki failed to be a king because his appointments mainly came from central Kenya. Yeah. Now, usually in Kenya, when a president feels threatened, and this has happened over and over again, they rush back to their tribe and appoint only people from their tribe because they feel safer, more protected, more secure with members of their tribe in key positions and powerful positions in government. And to make matters worse in Kibaki's case, Nobody ever believed or imagined that Kibaki would fall back into the tribal card. The backlash from the people was immediate because Kibaki had failed to be a king. 
And the saddest thing of all is that Kibaki did not even realize what the consequences of his ignoring his role as king of Kenya, what the consequences were on the masses. And therefore, during the 2007 elections, Kenyans went to the polls yeah, and cast a very angry vote, not for Raila Odinga. They cast an angry protest vote against Mwai Kibaki, yeah, of course, which meant a vote for Raila Odinga. You know the rest of that very sad story. The tribal clashes resulted and many, many Kenyans lost their lives. Yeah, we all know the story. And indeed, the crisis only ended with a grand coalition government yeah, of Kibaki and Raila. And the separate factions coming together to form a grand coalition government of national unity. And if truth be told, after that, Kibaki limped through the rest of his five years in office as president of the Republic of Kenya and left office without achieving the potential he would have been capable of achieving, all because he did not pay careful attention to the important balls in the air yeah, and some of those balls had to do with him being a king. He failed to be a king and therefore his presidency failed. Yeah, whatever achievements Kibaki had, those were just a minute fraction of what Mwai Kibaki was capable of achieving for the nation called Kenya. His initial agenda had too many aborted good things for Kenyans. Yeah, of course, top on the list was the fight against corruption, which he started with a lot of vigor and determination. Yeah, and some of us were sure he was going to achieve that Herculean task, that colossal task of reducing dramatically corruption in the nation called Kenya. Now, there's a very important critical point that I need to stress here. You see, before the 2010 constitution, it was very easy, or shall I say much easier, for a president to be king despite the circumstances. Because the presidency was all powerful. The president was everything. And so, constitutionally, they're already king. And this is why people like Moy, Daniel Toretichar of Moy, had no problem yeah, with being king over Kenya. But after the 2010 constitution was passed, that particular function, very vital to rule Kenya successfully, yeah, became even more difficult to achieve. And indeed, even when Uhuru Kenyatta took over, in 2013, he struggled, Ururuto struggled with that particular aspect of the presidency. It was only resolved after the handshake of March 2018 yeah, with Raila Odinga. After that, Uhuru easily achieved it. And evidence of that is the reaction of Kenyans wherever Uhuru Kenyatta still makes a public appearance. Kenyans love the man just the way you'd love your king. Yeah, a good king. A king, a good king, is respected. A good king is king without having to remind the people that he is their king. Yeah, it is rather obvious. They carry the royal authority. Now, it is super fascinating that Uru Kenyatta had a very huge advantage coming to the office of the presidency. And that is why he was able to recognize yeah, immediately that he was failing as a president. Yeah, he was failing to be king. Mwai Kibaki never recognized it. He never realized it. And the consequences were fatal. Kenyans lost their lives. William Samoy Ruto 
you are judging from all the signs, has yet to recognize yeah, this shortcoming and we await the consequences. You see, the huge advantage Uhuru had is that he grew up in state house. He saw his father function as the president. He not only had a front seat view, he was there as his father was in confidential meetings with various people, as his father made decisions, as his father complained about this and that, he was there. Yeah. And although he was still a kid, yeah, because his dad passed on when he was only about 17 years or 18 years old, he was still there. Let me just give you a quick example to prove my point. I know a lot of things about the police, things I should not know. Why? Because I grew up, I was there as a kid in the house of a very senior police officer, a senior cop. And therefore there are a lot of things I remember. There are a lot of things I can put together very quickly. Even today, as a result of things I saw when I was very young. Many of them I didn't even understand at the time what was really happening. But now as an older person, when I see them, I can quickly connect and put things together. Much better and much quicker and more than anybody else who was not in that situation. So I think I've driven my point home emphatically enough. And so fast forward to the present, we're in big trouble as a country because we are back to 2004-2005. When we had a president who did not realize that he was not being king. He was president constitutionally. But he did not realize that a very important function of the president of Kenya, being king, having royal authority, Kibaki did not realize that he didn't have that. And more importantly, he didn't realize how critically important it was to the stability of the nation called Kenya. And we all know how that ended. Oh, almighty God, have mercy on us. Remember mercy, O oh Lord, on the nation called Kenya. Now, before I go, I have something that will be very useful to very many people on this channel. You see, the audience this channel reaches is very unique. We have many, many Kenyans, regulars on this channel, who are in the diaspora. We have many, many Kenyans in very senior positions in our country and living within the borders of Kenya who are regulars. On this channel. We have many politicians who are regulars on this channel. That is a very unique audience. And in case you have a service or a product that you think this particular audience will be very interested in, yeah, and it is something genuine, something that will add value to their lives, Something that will help Kenyans through these very difficult times. Also through these very dangerous times. In case you have such a product or service, I will be very interested in partnering with you. And indeed even doing a video, a special video, focused on your product or service. Yeah, and of course doing it in an interesting way. Introducing a new interesting angle. Yeah, not from your point of view from the point of view of your potential customer, from the point of view of your most satisfied customers. So if you're in business, drop me an email. Yeah, you can see the email address on your screens right now. As my contribution to Mother Kenya at this difficult time, I will do that video for you completely for free. Yeah, using my voice, using my talent, using the knowledge I have gained over the years yeah, to be able to communicate to your potential audience, potential customers, 
in a way that it will be very difficult for you to communicate to them anywhere else. Okay, so I think you should take full advantage of this limited opportunity. Of course, I'll only take a limited number of businesses. Nasio Maringo, it is because it's not practical yeah, to do so many. So I'll just do a few as my contribution. Of course, I'll ask for a small fee for my time. Yeah, but of course, it will be a pittance, yeah, a fraction of what you'd have normally paid to reach such an audience. Yeah, so all you have to do is drop me an email. Give me as much detail about your business as possible. Yeah, send me your telephone number, if possible. And I will get back to you after I've done my research yeah, on your company, your business, etc., etc. I have my way, even to be able to reach your customers, your current customers, yeah, those who are satisfied. And if I think that you have something that will add value to the lives of Kenyans, I will do that for you. And I'm sure it will be of great benefit to you. And also it's yet another way to support this channel and to support our cause here for a better Kenya. It is all in line with that mission of a better Kenya. Kenya. Has this video made you intrigued about the presidency, especially the Kenyan presidency? Or have you always been fascinated by this office? Well, I have a recommendation to make. I have an ebook titled Dark Secrets of the Kenyan Presidency. Many of you have already read it, but many of you have also not read it. But that's not all. I have also adapted most of the book into videos. Yeah, and you can receive both the book and the videos based on the book in your email. Pop! In the next few seconds. Yeah, you can see the offer on your screens right now. Only $8.99. And I will even throw in something more. Three months free membership to my weekly intelligence briefings. Now that has to be the offer of the year. Yeah, so take full advantage of it. It will not last for long. Yeah, just one or two days. So please rush and make sure that you get hold of dark secrets of the Kenyan presidency. Yeah, it has some very fascinating stories. Most of them never before told. I'm sure you've never heard those stories. Yeah. And they're not just stories. Reality deep in state house. Okay. It is a super fascinating read. Yeah, and also super fascinating to watch those videos. Perfect for the weekend. Dark Secrets of the Kenyan Presidency is a book like no other. I have ever written and for me it was a very emotional experience I started writing it in 2008 when the horrors of the 2007 2008 clashes were still very fresh on my mind untold horror that no Hollywood movie can ever match and I knew then more than anybody else that indeed in Kenya, politics is a matter of life and death. And so writing this book was a journey of learning for me and a very steep learning curve yeah, for me. I finally completed it one day in 2009. The, the time was 3 or 5 a.m. I was exhausted, drained. And what is more, I had no idea what kind of contraption I had come up with. Was it good? Was it worth the read? Was it interesting? Because no matter how important your message is, if you do not deliver it in an interesting way, if you bore your audience, the message will never reach home. Looking back today, the reaction has always been very positive for this ebook. Some have called it a thriller. Many others have said it has changed forever 
the way they look at Kenyan politics. Until next time, this is Chris Komekoche.